Hello from the Communication Studies Department at Widener University. I'm Tim Sempansky, and welcome to this edition of Voices from Freedom. On today's show, entitled Echoes from the Past, the PMC Tradition, we'll talk with George Biotvet from the Pennsylvania Military College, class of 1951. George, the Communication Studies Department welcomes you. Thank you. How's it feel to be back on campus? Outstanding. When was the last time you were back on campus? Oh, about 14 years ago. Really? How, what has changed since then? Oh, the, re the refurbishment of Old Main is fantastic, and the chemistry building that I remember as chemistry building has a nice facade. The grounds are beautiful. The students are great. The buildings are excellent. Great, great. Um, did you get get a chance to go up the dome in Old Main? No, not this trip, but I do got to see my old room. Really, oh, yeah, really. Old now, did you get a chance to sign up in the dome? No, I didn't. I, but we were close. We had the dome, which was the newspaper, which was close to the dome. So I am very familiar with the octagon. That's, that, that's neat. I was actually the faculty advisor to the Dome for almost 10 years. Oh, fantastic. From 2002 to 2010. I was a cub reporter. Were you really? I worked my way up. I became an associate editor, but I initially was a cub reporter. So one of the things we wanted to talk to you about today is you became friends with legendary Hollywood director Cecil B. DeMille, um, who attended PMC. Um, can you talk about how your friendship with Mr. DeMille kind of uh, uh, was created and how, how you came upon to meet him? I was in L.A. visiting a, a, an ex-girlfriend, my first love, as they say, and she was entered in a lot of beauty contests. She was wanted to crack into the Hollywood, the, the factory of, of dreams, and she would go on. She was always a finalist, which I never could contemplate. So I was sitting around doing nothing, and I recall that DeMille had been here for two years, so I sat down, I wrote him a letter, I used the directory to get his mailing address, and I sent him a letter saying I was in town, that I was a cub reporter on the college paper, and I just sent it in the mail to DeMille Drive. I don't remember his street number, but sure enough, within 48 hours, I got a phone call saying that DeMille would like to see me, he would dri drive by and pick me up and take me to Paramount Studios. What year was that? 1949. Wow. Now, that was a year, there was a time when people were going out to California for jobs and opportunity. Can you talk about, um, uh, you know, the experiences of traveling to, to even thinking about traveling out to California? I always wanted to go to California. When I finished my summer ROTC camp, I happened to meet two students from the University of Nevada who uh, drove across country, and now they were going to go back, taking the southern route. So I asked, do you mind if you take another passenger. So they agreed and I went with them and wound up at Loganville for a week, worked on some irrigation dishes with them and then I, from there I hitched to, to LA. But uh, Loganville is about 60 miles northeast of uh, what we used to refer, we refer to Los Wages, I mean Las Vegas as Los Wages. <laughs> so uh, from there I, I hitched a ride by a truck driver and I got to to, to LA and I met my ex-girlfriend and I stayed with her. So what was your first impressions of uh, Cecil B. DeMille when you first met him? Oh, uh, first of all, his publicist walked me down his corridor, which was carpeted, wood paneling on both sides with placards of his previous accomplishments. It was a long, long walk and uh, Mr. Corey opened the door and there he was, this big, huge desk and come on in and I just couldn't believe the the warmth that this man expressed. Uh, Charlton Heston was there. He was doing the Ten Commandments, some of the flicks, so I was introduced to him, sat down, and DeMille took over the interview, and I just sat there like, <laughs> what is new? So uh, excellent, very, very warm, very open, very friendly, no uh, pretenses. Was that before um, Ten Commandments was actually released to theaters? Or yes, was he was uh, doing some of the finishing touches. Yeah, so he made some epic Hollywood uh, yeah, films. I, I made the mistake of asking him why, and he's, his answer was simply, when they're re-released, they'll be as fresh as when, they, when I first produced or directed them. You got a chance to get on the set of uh, The Greatest Show on Earth when he was filming in here in Philadelphia, right? That's right. I, I had a friend that his name was Tom Canary, who was my classmate, and I happened to mention the fact that I knew DeMille. He said, oh, come on, George, you, you, what are you trying to say? So uh, I wrote him a note again. Uh, he was there for, you know, for a long time because Ringley Brothers were his, was in the town for the circus. 
and I got a note back that said, uh, met these two cadets to the big top. So there we were, we're watching Betty Hutton and Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy Stewart, right? Stewart, yeah, yeah, he's doing the clown, he's talking to his mother, that scene. So it was a thrill. Oh, how exciting is that? Two, two of the biggest stars in Hollywood. Well, oh, well, I, d I wasn't that close to the, personally, but, but I, I was, I saw and I, I exchanged, I thanked uh, DeMille, but I didn't see uh, personally uh, Jimmy Stewart or uh, Oh, they weren't shooting scenes that day? They were shooting, but I was, you know, I, was, I wasn't in the inner circle at that sure. time. Sure. It still had to be exciting oh, yes. um, watching the production. Oh, yes, definitely. He always put on huge productions with uh, hundreds of extras. Yes, it was just a very warm, I would say, no errors about him. I know you, you uh, served in the Korean War. Yes. Um, how, how many years did you serve there? Active duty, th three years, inactive, six. I spent 10 months in Korea. Wow, wow. Uh, so I know that you had a little bit of um, exchanges with DeMille when oh. you were over uh, there. Can you talk about uh, you know, that, that experience? Yes, uh, during World War II, there were pinups from celebrities, from you know starlets and stars, actress, actresses, and they would always send photographs to the GIs. So I happened to mention again that I happened to knew Cecil B. DeMille. I said, ah, I don't believe you, George. So I wrote to him, and sure enough, Phil Corey sent, must have been at least 15 half prints with signatures wishing us the best and we distributed it to our company. So we, uh, we were the only company online that had pinups from, from Hollywood. You had so to be a pretty popular guy around that time, right? Yeah, th uh, some people said it's a shame that you lost all those photos. <laughs> <laughs> Probably heirlooms now, but sure. it, was, it, was a, it was a nice gesture. You talk about uh, your PMC experience and uh, how that helped you as a leader um, and how, how that helped you in your life. Well, first of all, I came here as a disciplinary problem, and uh, I had trouble acclimating to the the rigors of uh, a strict, organized, uh, disciplined environment. So I was a private for three and a half years, and I guess my last year I I gave I said, "Okay, you win, I lose," and the the organization, the uh, the good ROTC program, it just provided me with enough knowledge and enough experience that I, what I did actually go into the Army, it was just like a second nature. Okay. And how many years were you, uh, I guess, a cadet here? Uh, four years. Four years, yep, all four years. I made uh, platoon sergeant my second semester of my senior year. Excellent. Your, that wasn't your only experience with Hollywood when you, uh, you know, had a friendship with Cecil B. DeMille. Um, I know that you had an opportunity to sell some of your Korean War stories, some of the stories that you wrote to the producers of MASH, the uh, popular TV series. You're right. Show. Uh, my daughter came to me and said, Dad, it looks like they're running out of stories on this, the TV episode, the sitcom MASH. So I said, she said, why don't you write some of your war stories? So I got a bottle of... Uh, S uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, year 1969, Robert Mondavi, and I sat down, and of course I consumed the bottle, but in the, <laughs> in the consumption of the bottle, I came out with 10 line stories, uh, brief war experiences, and I shipped it to Gelbart in, in, in Manhattan, and, and I guess that was not the place to send it, so they, he sent it out to, to uh, Gene Reynolds, who was the producer of the TV show w with uh, Fox, and they accepted it, and uh, I was interviewed on the phone. I guess his, ta his recorder broke, and I said, well, I could come over as a consultant to fill in some of the, s the spaces, so why not? So I went over as a consultant. They bought the stories, 10 of them. They incorporated about five of them in the uh, 75 session. Okay, season, so 75 season, sure. Well, that was right in the middle of uh, probably its greatest popularity, right? Yes, yes. Uh, Gene Reynolds was a really uh, gentleman. Uh, the stars were very good. Harry Morgan was exceptionally uh, well. He signed a couple of his photographs. I mean, he said, I'll do it on the front, not on the back. It's that, that's, that's not proper.
You got to be on the set of that television show yeah, as well? Yeah, we, uh, we uh, went over and we took Canary, the same chap that went with me to see The Big Top with Cecil B. DeMille, and we took all the whole, the whole family, all the children, and Gene Reynolds made room for us on the set. Uh, this was on the enclosed set right on the studio lot. They had an off-campus facility where they shot the outdoor scenes. So we were uh, primarily in the close hangar type situation. Could you compare the two sets of, you know, uh, The Greatest Show on Earth with Cecil B. DeMille and a television show, MASH? Uh, were they similar? Were they different? Uh, well, it, one was that the, where they had there, it was just above uh, the hills of, overlooking Malibu Beach. So the topography was similar to what they had in Korea. Well, I was uh, surprised because I had a coat of crumbs of some of the uh, scenery over there. So it was really smaller in, in perspective. They, uh, they had the outdoor the hospital and the w living quarters, whereas DeMille, when he was shooting those things in, in Philadelphia, was relying on the, the Ringley brothers to provide him with the, the bods, the, 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 the spectators, mm -hmm. and he didn't have to worry about setting up anything that was set up for him. So he used their, their big tops, their yes. animals, all right. those. Um, so did they actually shoot the exteriors? of the TV show MASH in the, the hills of Malibu? Uh, no, they did that at uh, Fox Studios, uh, the in interior shots. The exterior shots, they had it similar to the uh, opening scenes where uh, in the movie set, they retained all the tents, all the uh, roads and whatnot. That, that was a permanent outdoor set. Okay, because so the, 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 the uh, motion picture of MASH preceded the TV show right. MASH. So the movie came out and then the television right. show uh, Followed right. Uh, Altman uh, was the director of the movie, and uh, so Gene Reynolds took it over, and they made it into a uh, series, and it was so popular it ran for at least ten years. And they said, you know, if these actors work four seasons, they don't have to work anymore. Sure. And I remember the um, the show finale. It was the um, the most watched television show right. or event ever at the time. So it was a really really popular show. It was. Um, how did you feel w seeing your stories? on the show at the end, right? You watch the, that episode and it has your your story in it. Was there any feelings, mixed feelings, or were you? No, I just the kids knew about it, the, my children, I should say. Uh, the one with the German Shepherd, I used a dog, a German Shepherd on patrols in Korea into no man's land, and uh, of course, Gene Reynolds knew about the scout dogs and he wanted to do us an episode to give them credit. So the opening scene is, uh, Burns comes in and he sees his four legs and on an opera. What is this? This looks like a dog. And he says, you can't use military facilities to operate on a dog. And he says, well, this guy's a corporal. <laughs> He's wearing a fur coat. So it, uh, and then I, the kids used to refer to the TV show as Daddy's War. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Gene incorporated that theme and called it Mulcahy's War, which was the one hour introduction for the, the 75 season. Okay. So um, you wrote the stories, and did they add the comedy? Is that how that worked? Yes, or? they sort of, the one show they used three, and they blended it in. There was one, one scene where, where the 65th Puerto Rican Regiment was dissolved. One of the commanding officers insisted that all the Puerto Ricans would shave their mustaches off. I see mm. you wearing ones. And this is, they did this, the, the cultural thing was at puberty, at 14 years of age, they start shaving and they carry this mustache for, the, for, for life. And this guy was shaving, he had to take half off. He looks in the mirror, he goes ballast, ballistic. And uh, they had to take him to uh, the local mesh hospital. Hmm. I was uh, taken to a Norwegian mesh, so, uh, which was fortunate because I could speak the language. And of course, we met some of the nurses and we went to their officers club and they treated us before we went back on the line again. Nice. Yes, it was very nice. You spent some time in Hollywood uh, working on MASH, but you only did that as like a consultant basis. Right, and then when they shot Mulcahy's War, which was a, a one hour scene, where I took my daughter over, where you had a motorhome at the time, we just parked it at the uh, campsite, and then I would drive into the lot, uh, to the outdoor uh, f uh, facility, and of course, I parked it within the, the, se the uh, set, and I had to move it, you know, and I, unbeknownst to me that I had 
the audacity to, <laughs> to incorporate Who do you think the, you are, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but they were, they were good, though. They, they were very, very accommodating. Okay. So, you, you know, you, you mentioned the, the short uh, with the German Shepherd. And I know after that you went into veterinarian research, or were you already into yes, that? Yes, right. I, I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I was self-employed basically, and uh, my mother-in-law suggested, why don't you become a veterinarian? I said, hey, that's a great idea. So I, I was fortunate that we, this PMC was accredited so I could apply to the University of Pennsylvania, and I, I was successful. I wound up with the medical profession. I didn't practice. I were, went into the real the real doctor community i worked as a pathologist i would they would do research on animals and i would keep them honest nice yes and i had no complaints from my my subjects all right well i mean i'd just like to thank you for sharing your stories and, i appreciate you know, the opportunity yeah your friendship with cecil Vita mill and then some of the work you did with mash and some of the other things i really uh i think we can kind of learn something from uh, some of these stories and some of your experiences. Voices from Freedom, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.